Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. Um, we all are aware of uh, the news of the unfortunate uh, tragedy uh, over the course um, of the weekend of the three um, Khatufim or the hostages that were killed inadvertently uh, by our own. It's unfortunate news. It is the reality of war, but it is very, very unfortunate, of course, and disheartening. Um, our thoughts and our tefillot go out to all of the families. Um, for me in particular, mm -hmm. I can't help but constantly think of those that were involved in the inadvertent uh, killing of our own Khatufim, because they have to live with this forever, even though at the moment they felt as if they were doing the absolute right thing to protect themselves in Am Yisrael. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's something that they will never, ever be able to live down. So our thoughts are with all of them this morning. And I would like to uh, dedicate uh, this morning's uh, shiur in particular to those three um, that were killed um, inadvertently over the course of the weekend. Um, again, for those of us that are just uh, joining in now, good morning to all of you. Some of you I have not yet met before, neither on Zoom nor in person, as this is my first opportunity uh, to give this series of shiurim um, on a Sunday. I usually am doing Monday or Wednesday. Um, once we do get back to the regular shigra, uh, the regular uh, schedule, I usually have been, at least for the last year or so, been presenting on late Wednesday mornings at 11.45 a.m. Whether or not that will continue, or I will continue in that slot, or a different slot remains to be seen. But in any event, please, all of you keep in mind that all of the OU um, Israel shiurim are recorded and they are archived um, at OU Israel and many of them are to be seen on YouTube and there's a link in Torah Tidbits for this particular series of Chizuk shiurim as well. But again, good morning to you all and it's good to see all of you. Okay. I'm going to ask you, Shai, to please... Um, yeah, thank you. If we could all just stay muted, that would be the best thing. Thank you. Okay, we're ready to begin. Today, since... We are on the heels of yesterday, of Shabbat. I would like to uh, devote our learning today to the Haftarah of yesterday. And the particular reason is that this particular Haftarah is rarely read. Why so? Because people are under the, the misimpression that Parashat Miketz always falls on Shabbat Chanukah. That's close to correct. It doesn't always fall close to Shabbat Chanukah, excuse me, on Shabbat Chanukah, it virtually always does, or almost always does. There are rare exceptions when Miketz does not fall on Shabbat Chanukah. Since there is a special Haftarah for Shabbat Chanukah, on those rare occasions when Parashat Miketz is not read on Chanukah, such as this year, when it's read the week after Chanukah, we read the Haftarah for Parashat Miketz, which is clearly very rarely read, based on what I just mentioned. So just to give you an example, this year, in the year 2023, we actually read Parashat Miketz the week after Shabbat Chanukah, and we read the Haftarah for Miketz. The last time was three years ago, in the year 2020. But the last time before that was 20 years prior, in the year 2000, and then four years earlier, in 1996. We read the regular Haftarah for Miketz yesterday, since it was not Shabbat Chanukah. The next time, if I'm doing the math right, will be 17 years from now in the year 2040. So it really rarely happens. And because it rarely happens, even though, as we will see, it is a story with which we are all familiar, is one of the more famous stories, I, I believe, in all of Tanakh, uh, who does not know this story, since it's virtually never read as the Haftarah for Shabbat of Miketz, I would like to uh, devote our learning to that story this morning. There's some very interesting background to the story, and the background is as follows, and I'm going to read it to you. I apologize, I did not have a chance to, uh, it's my fault, I did not take the chance, I should say, to prepare an actual, an actual a sheet uh, to share with you on the screen this morning, but I would like just to read from, for you just a brief piece of the introduction. Shlomo HaMelech, has just been anointed king. HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to Shlomo, uh, where he is at the time in Giv'on, 
And again, this backstory we also know, but I believe the wording here is very important. HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to Shlomo and he says to him, Sha'al ma'eten lach, ask me what you would like. What would you like to wish for? I am your, jir- your genie today. I'm with a capital G because I'm God. Two capital Gs, of course, the G for God and the G for genie. And I will grant you, not three, but one wish of your choice. And Shlomo HaMelech answers as follows. He doesn't begin with himself. And I think that that's very telling. He could have said, I wish for the following in order to be to be accepted as the Melech of the people or in order to be successful as a Melech. He doesn't do that. He begins with a preface. And that is, Ata asita im abdecha David avdi chesed gadol. You did a great chesed, a great kindness for my father, for he went before you, be'emet uvitztaka uvishrat lev. He was a just person before you, and therefore you did things for him. Vatish morlo et ha chesed ha gadol hazeh, and you gave him the great chesed. What was the great chesed? The chesed that he had wanted. Vatiten lo ven, you provided for him a son who now sits on the throne. In other words, you granted my dad, the Melech, of course, the genesis of the Davidic dynasty, hence called the Davidic dynasty, at least in English, or Malchut David in the Hebrew. And now it continues through me. That was a gift that you provided to my father. Shlomo HaMelech could have begun with himself. He didn't. He begins with his father. And so to me, it's already very telling that Shlomo HaMelech understands that he now has the privilege, the opportunity, and the responsibility to see to it that the Davidic dynasty continues and that it has stability going forward. And that will be very telling. We all know what he asks for. Who doesn't know this story? And so therefore, he asks as follows, several psukim later, Benatatala Avdecha, Please give to your servant, meaning to me, lev shomea, a listening heart. Everybody thinks that he asks for wisdom, he does, but it's not put so succinctly by Shlomo. A lev shomea, a lev that listens, mishpot et amacha, to be able to judge your people, lahavin, to discern, and that word is also very important, to discern ben tov l'ra, to discern between good and bad. Anybody could be born brilliant. And Shlomo HaMelech is considered to be among the most, if not the most brilliant man that ever lived. And maybe he was born as the most brilliant simply in terms of, for example, being able to solve every single math problem that ever arose in split seconds before the advent of modern technology. That's one level of brilliance. But that's not what he's asking for, even if he was provided that. He's asking for the ability to discern because who is able to judge this very difficult people? Not only are we very stubborn, we at the time were also, Baruch Hashem, a large enough of a nation that Shlomo HaMelech realized that it would take a special gift from HaKadosh Baruch Hu to be able to be successful in that particular endeavor. What does HaKadosh Baruch Hu say to him? Since you, Shlomo, asked for this gift of wisdom, and you did not ask for wealth, and you did not ask for glory, I'm going to grant you your wish and all of the others, too, that, of course, you clearly want. And we know that Shlomo HaMelech, indeed, does become exceptionally wealthy, for example, in addition to that. And then HaKadosh Baruch Hu adds to Shlomo, V'im te'lech bidrachai, if you follow on my path, if you walk on my ways, v'shmor chukai u'mitzvotai ka'asher halach David avicha, just like your predecessor, your dad, David did v'harachti et yamecha, I will also allow you to live a long life. That's the backstory. In the immediate aftermath of that story, we have the Haftarah of yesterday, and that is the story of the two women. We sometimes forget the detail that these are two prostitutes. They're referred to as Zonot in the text. These are two prostitutes that were living in the same quarters, that each of them had a baby, and they come to Shlomo HaMelech. And the story, just to be clear, is really very simple. 
one woman un- inadvertently lied upon her son in the middle of the night, and her son therefore died. The other woman had a son who lived. The one whose son died switched the babies in the middle of the night. And now the two of them came to Shlomo HaMelech arguing whose baby is the one that was living and whose baby is the one that had unfortunately passed away due to an inadvertent accident on the part of his mother, who clearly, even though she was an Isha Zona, even though she had been a prostitute, and it's, I think, very possible, if not probable, that neither one of them knew who the father was of their particular child. Nevertheless, she clearly loved her child dearly. They come to Shlomo HaMelech, and Shlomo HaMelech hears their story, hears their discussion, their argument, and he needs to be able to discern, and that's the same word that I used before, lehavin, in his request from HaKadosh Baruch Hu for wisdom, to be able to discern which one of these mothers, which one of these mothers is the true mother of the child that is still living. How does one discern that? And so what he did was as follows. The king commanded his servants, and he said, Take for me a sword, bring me a sword. They brought the sword to the king. What does the king do? He says as follows, Now take that sword, and again, we all know the story, and literally slice, it's uh, a little bit gory, so I apologize for this, but this is the text, nevertheless, slice the baby in half, the living child in half. We'll split it evenly. You give half to one, you give half to the other. The woman, one woman, responded with, no, don't do that. Give her the baby. Don't dare slice the baby in half. The other woman decided, no, Shlomo HaMelech, you, the king, are absolutely correct. We both claim to be the mother of the baby. Give each of us half of the baby, and we'll share the baby. Shlomo HaMelech, of course, realized that that woman must be a liar because no mother of a child would wish for her baby to be killed, but rather the one who's willing to give up her child clearly is the real mother. That seems to be the story on the surface level. Not so, says Don Yitzchak Abarbanel. Abarbanel says as follows, pay attention to what Shlomo HaMelech asked for in his dream, because this story follows in the immediate aftermath. He did not ask for wisdom. He asked for the ability to discern, but more importantly, the backdrop, as we mentioned before, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu granted him his one wish, whatever he wished for, he began with his father, David HaMelech. He began with, whatever I am asking you to grant me, whatever that wish is, which happens, which happens to be lavin to be able to discern vein tohu vein ra, is with that in mind of my father's dynasty. That's what I have in mind, and therefore says Abar Benel that Shlomo HaMelech was able to look at these women, and he was able to discern just by their physical appearance by what he calls their partsuf, which literally means their face. And I believe what he's referring to is their facial expressions. He was able to tell by hearing their story and by their appearance which one was telling the truth and which one was lying before he even asked for the sword to be brought before him. To him, it was as clear as night and day. He knew which one was the liar. He knew which one was the real mother. But he had something else in mind, according to Abar Benel. He wanted to get the word out there. He needed for his people to believe that he had this ability to discern. And if he simply would have heard their story and would have said, this one is the real mother, and I can tell by looking at her, and this one is the liar, and I can tell by looking at her facial expressions, either that she's embarrassed or that she's stuttering or whatever it may be, then yes, word would have gotten out but it would have not necessarily spread like a wildfire like it did, and he certainly would have not have been, have been accepted by all of the people as the true inheritor of his father's dynasty. 
And so HaKadosh Baruch Hu provided David HaMelech with this brilliant plan to bring for him a sword so that he could say to his servants in front of the women, slice the baby in half. When people heard of this brilliant solution, he was accepted countrywide as the successor of his father. Shlomo HaMelech then, by definition, if I'm understanding Abar Benel correctly, and if I'm not understanding Abar Benel 100% correctly, then maybe some of this is my own idea, but I'd like to give credit to Abar Benel, because he only says it in so many words and succinctly, and that is that he was looking for a solution not just to the problem that these two women had, and in his original request from God, he was not looking for wisdom for himself, but in the solution to the problem that the women the women had, he was looking for a way for his father's successor to be, excuse me, to be accepted by all of the people, and thereby guaranteeing the future, the smooth transition, as he is now the new king, but the smooth transition and the continuity of the Davidic dynasty into the future. That's what Shlomo HaMelech's main concern was. That was the backdrop of his asking for wisdom. And that indeed was what was provided for him in this brilliant plan that he came up with through, excuse me, through the aid, through the assistance of HaKadosh Baruch Hu of bringing to him the sword. It was all about the future. It was all about the stability. It was all about Shlomo HaMelech realizing that my people are going to be okay. That things will be, as Hashem, be able to continue into the future, just as they did during the time of my father, of David HaMelech. Keeping that in mind, we are now ready to connect the Haftarah to this week's Parashat HaShavuah. On a very simple level, meaning yesterday's Parashat HaShavuah, on which the Haftarah is read. On a very simple level, both of these parashot, or excuse me, the parasha and the haftarah involve a dream. Yosef, who had dreams himself, Yosef, who had already interpreted the dream of the Sarha Mashkim and the Sarha Ofim, this same Yosef is now summoned to interpret the dreams of Paro. Shlomo HaMelech's story begins with a dream in which HaKadosh Baruch Hu appears to him and says to him, I will grant you one wish. What do you wish for? So there's that common theme as well, that common denominator of dreams. But there's so much more to it. And that is the link between the personality of Yosef as he interprets Paro's dreams and Shlomo HaMelech as he interprets, as it were, or discerns who is the real mother in the case that came before him of these two um, women, of these two prostitutes who each claimed to be the mother of the living baby. And listen carefully to the text that we find by Yosef. Yosef comes to Paro as he is summoned. But prior to that, the text tells us that Paro gave the opportunity to others, to his um, to his chartumim, to his chachamim. The Torah uses the word chachamim. He uses, the, the Torah uses the word his wise men to interpret his dreams for him. In other words, his interpreters. He came to them and he said, I've got a problem. I had this dream. Please tell me what the dream means. Please tell me the interpretation, the meaning of the dream. And the Torah text tells us, he told them his dream, and there was nobody who was able to interpret them to Faro. Ask yourself a question. Is that last word, Faro, really necessary? All the Torah needed to say to us was, nobody could interpret the dreams properly. The text doesn't say that. The text says the Ain Poter Otam Lifaro, and that there was no one that was able of all of his Khartoumim and Chachamim, not one of them was able to interpret them Lifaro. Picking up on that word, Rashi quoting a Midrash 
explains that what the text is telling us is not that they were not able to come up with interpretations. There were interpretations that were pitronim or interpretations aplenty. They came up with many wild and crazy ideas, but none of them were the faro. None of them were, were accepted by Paro. None of them were interpretations that Paro could say, thank you, that must be the Pitaron, the interpretation of my dream, and I thank you very much for interpreting my dream for me. And so Rashi brings one example of many, and that is, since the dreams involved seven years of healthy cows, and then seven years of unhealthy cows, and since the dream, the second dream involved, or maybe it was the other way around, the first dream involved seven healthy stalks and then and then seven unhealthy stalks, the unhealthy ones in both dreams eating or consuming the healthy ones. Therefore, the interpretation Rashi brings down that was provided for him by the Khartoumim and Khatamim and Khartoumim, excuse me, and Khachamim was Sheva Banot Ata Molid, Sheva Banot Ata Kover. That's in correlation to the seven healthy ones and the seven unhealthy ones, and that the healthy ones will consume the unhealthy ones, you will have seven daughters, but you will also bury seven daughters. Now, whether or not that really means you will bury the same daughters, that those seven daughters will die, or whether it means you will have seven daughters, and in addition to that, seven other of your daughters will die, either way, the Torah tells us, for the many years that I taught this in the classroom, when we were still living in the States, I would teach my students or ask them to come up with an idea of why they thought Paro could not accept this as the interpretation. And one after the other, after the other, down the line, said it's very simple, and they're not wrong, and that is, and my kids came up with this, these were fourth graders, who wants to hear news like that? When you hear something like that, your immediate reaction, at least Paro's immediate reaction was, wait, you're telling me I'm going to have seven daughters and my daughter's going to die? I don't want to hear it. Get out of here. Maybe that's what it means. But I think there's more to it than that. I think that with the insight we had that was provided for us by the, the backdrop, the backstory to Shlomo HaMelech, and Abar Benel's understanding of Shlomo HaMelech we can use that to discern precisely what it was about those dreams that Paro was not willing to accept, or those interpretations, and why he was willing to accept Yosef's interpretation. And we all know what Yosef's interpretation was. Yosef's interpretation was, there will be seven years of famine, excuse me, seven years of plenty, followed by seven years of famine, and Yosef said to Paro, that not only am I able to provide for you the interpretation, and he said, Hello, Lelo, King Petronim, this interpretation you should know, this isn't even about me. It comes from God. And please tell me your dream. Paro does. And Yosef responds with the Pitaron, with the interpretation that I just mentioned a moment ago. And then he adds a solution to the problem of how to get out of the problem. And I believe therein lies the secret to why it was that according to Rashi, Paro was not willing to accept the other interpretations. The other interpretations were about Paro, and only about Paro. Sheva banot ata molid, sheva banot ata kover, you will have seven daughters, those seven daughters will die, end of the story. It's a tragic story, but it has nothing to do with the message according to Yosef, nothing to do with the message that was being sent to Paro in his dreams. Number one, the dreams were about the land. The dreams were about livestock. They were about cows. They were about produce. Number two, in addition to that, they were about the land of Egypt. They weren't about the private land of Paro. The dreams had nothing to do with a personal message being sent to Paro, but rather, Yosef understood, the dreams were representative of something that is going to be taking place on a national level. And it is going to be a national tragedy, a national travesty. But unlike past famines, which were relatively rampant then, in Egypt, 
and still are to some extent in the Middle East when there's a famine in certain regions. This time, Paro is being given a dream. In other words, he's being pre-told or forewarned of what is about to take place so that he can have somebody come in as the interpreter and to provide a way out, to provide a solution this time around for how to survive that particular famine. That is the responsibility, that is the gift with which HaKadosh Baruch Hu has provided me. And so I, Yosef, will do my best to fulfill that role. Paros Chachamim Chartumim did not understand that. Shlomo HaMelech understood that that was his responsibility, to continue the Davidic dynasty and to convince his people that David HaMelech's reign will indeed continue relatively peacefully through him. Unfortunately, after that time, Shlomo HaMelech had no control over it, and indeed, things weren't exactly peaceful, even leading up to that. But at least for there to be a smooth transition and for the people to believe that Shlomo HaMelech is the true inheritor of his father's reign. Yosef similarly understood that right now, the nation of Egypt is going to go through a similarly very, similarly but different, very difficult period. And Paro and his people, the Egyptians, needed to realize that we are going to survive this. We will survive this transition of sorts. We'll survive this famine, and we will thrive. And that is indeed what Yosef provides for Paro. Today, we're going through a very similar scenario. We're unfortunately going through a very similar scenario that metaphorically, that Egypt was going through then. Then it was a literal famine of the land. Today, on one hand, just as we mentioned, that all of this begins with dreams, that that's the common theme tying everything together in the parasha and in the haftarah. Yosef had his own dreams. He had become already an interpreter of others' dreams. Now he is interpreting the dream for Paro, Shlomo HaMelech's uh, wish was granted to him in a dream. And similarly, we, Baruch Hashem, those of us living here, and Jews worldwide who are not yet living in Eretz Yisrael, we are able to live our dream. As we say in Shira HaMalot of Hayinu Kecholamim, we are living our dream, Baruch Hashem, of returning to Eretz Yisrael. But nobody said that was going to be easy. And just like we have the devastating story that we read of yesterday in the Haftarah of two women, one whose child had died tragically, and just like Egypt was now on the cusp when Paro had his dreams of utter devastation and also of tragedy, of famine, which they normally would not have been able to survive with ease had Yosef not come along to not only interpret, but to provide a way out for. Similarly today, we are going through, once again, another one of our national travesties, another one of another war, another tragic situation where our enemies wish for nothing but to destroy us and really, it's in their charter to destroy Jewry worldwide. Both Shlomo and Yosef's approaches to their challenges, with their eye to the future, their eye towards stability, they, I believe, inform our current challenge. Not only do we, Am Israel, have a responsibility, of course, of course, to destroy Hamas because of the havoc that they wish excuse me, that they, uh, they have uh, that they uh, wish to bring to the entire world and not only to Jews, because who knows who they have in mind next, but also we have the responsibility of paving the road towards stability for our region and to alleviate the threat that is posed uh, not only to our beloved Eretz Israel, but to the entire Western world. Baruch Hashem, 
while there are setbacks along the way, such as this tragedy over the course of the weekend, uh, to which I devoted our shiur this morning, uh, or dedicated, excuse me, our shiur this morning to the three chatufim, to the three, uh, to the three, excuse me, that were killed over the course of the weekend. In addition to that, we know that every single person involved, whether it's our chayalim and chayalot or others involved, are not only acting in a way that they feel is the right thing to do at the moment, but they are doing so, of course, with the blessings of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu that just like he provided for Shlomo HaMelech in the story of the Haftarah, and in Yosef, in the story of the parasha, the parasha Tashavuah yesterday, a parashat Miketz, not only the insight that Shlomo HaMelech asked for, not only this ability of discernment, discernment that Yosef himself realized was indeed his very mission, and that is to provide an immediate solution to the immediate problem, but just as both of them realized that they have an opportunity and a responsibility to provide for the transition to the future and to see to a brilliant and bright future for Paro as for his people, for Yosef, meaning through Yosef, for Shlomo HaMelech, it was for the future of our very people, of Am Yisrael, and their success going forward. Similarly, we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that he will give all of those in whom we trust to lead us, be it our political leaders and be it our leaders on the ground in this particular war, be it Achayalim and Chayalot, and all of those that are day-to-day fighting on our behalf to not only be successful in defeating Hamas now, in defeating the en- enemy that we have now, but into seeing our way into the future, into a peaceful continuity of Am Yisrael, just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu provided that insight for Yosef, and then in turn provided it for Shlomo HaMelech. May indeed we witness more peaceful times and be able to just sit back and bask in the glory, once again, of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, not only protecting us, but into realizing our dream of Hayinu Kecholami. Okay, we will stop our shiur here for this morning. I wish all of you a good week, and may this week provide us with good news ahead. Be well.